So, <laughs> thank you very much for uh, inviting me back to this meeting. Uh, as you know, I've been to Egypt many times and uh, made many friends. Dear Professor and, Lassuk, uh, you, yes. are, you are welcome. It is our honor and the pleasure to have you with us <laughs> this night. Always we are eager to learn from you because we consider Professor Glassock as the father of nephrology. Uh, we enjoyed all your presentation. I uh, attended with you uh, since tw 12 years at Harvard, and I enjoyed your presentation in Egypt for many times. We consider Professor Glassock an Egyptian professor, and we are very proud that you are with us this night, and this is a, a real success for the Nephro Alex organization to invite one of the pillars of nephrology in the world, more than 600 publications, one of the highest uh, H index in the Scobus, the past president uh, of the American Society of Nephrology since many decades. We are honored by your presence and moreover, your wisdom in approaching the diseases. Today we will <coughs> learn from you and we are eager to learn from you in the next November about the primer of glomerulonephritis, so focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis, a lesion, not a disease. The title carries the wisdom that we uh, uh, expected from uh, your presence. So your presence is a real advantage for us, and we are uh, here to hear your wisdom about this lesion, FSGS. Thank you very much for that very kind invitation and introduction. Uh, I want to assure you that uh, I hold my colleagues in Egypt with a high degree of respect, so all of the feelings that you have just expressed are reciprocated by me. I wish I could be there with you in person. Uh, I always enjoy my visits to Egypt and the surrounding areas. But uh, circumstances prevent it, so we'll have to do it this way. And uh, I have prepared a talk on FSGS. I gave a talk on this topic in February of 2017, before the Egyptian Society. And I decided to revisit this topic because there have been substantial advances in our knowledge uh, that I think are worth uh, commenting upon. So, uh, I think we're all familiar with what uh, the lesion of FSGS looks like under the light microscope. This silver methanamine stain clearly shows a segmental lesion with hyalinosis. This would be categorized as a not otherwise specified form of the histologic lesion. But, of course, a lesion doesn't necessarily indicate the definition of a disease because this appearance on the light microscopy is the pattern of injury. It's not an identification of a specific disease entity because this lesion can occur as a consequence of a wide array of pathogenetic processes. Now, by light microscopy, the lesion of FSGS is quite heterogeneous, and I'll be sharing that later on in this talk. But I want to emphasize initially that electron microscopy is a requirement for the full evaluation of this lesion. Because the lesion of FSGS is only focal by light microscopy, and optimal management requires a very good understanding of both the potential and actual causes of the lesion. Now, as of 2020, this lesion can be divided into four major categories. A primary form, which is always a diagnosis of exclusion, likely to be due to a circulating factor, which is toxic to podocytes, Probably not one single disease entity, but we're very uncertain about that. And 
in 2020, there have been numerous papers suggesting that instead of calling it primary FSGS, we might want to call it permeability factor related P, uh, FSGS, abbreviated PF FSGS going forward. The other, one of the other major categories are the genetic and heretofamilial forms. There are now 50 or more monogenic or digenic mutations identified, which can be inherited in a variety of ways. And then, of course, secondary <clears throat> forms of FSGS, which arise due to an identifiable disease or etiology, and about 35 of those have been identified so far. All the bigger step is made to identify whether the patient has primary, genetic, or secondary. There are always cases which cannot be identified as to the specific cause. And this is also known as FSGS of unknown origin. I don't personally like the term idiopathic because it may be confused with the terminology used for primary FSGS. Now, as of 2020, we, we understand that there are at least five pathways involved in production lesion. There must be an initiating event, and that can be widely varied from permeability factors to mutations, to toxic injury, to stress and inflammation. And this event then leads to injurious cellular processes involving the podocyte. That's why SGS lesion is regarded as a podocytopathy. The pathways involved in the injury to the podocyte vary apoptosis, impaired autophagy, detachment, dedifferentiation. But damage to one podocyte can lead to damage in other podocytes. These are paracryl effects. Uh, one author has called this infectious podocyte injury in that uh, it can initiate a cascade of damage to adjacent podocytes. These damaged podocytes upregulate signaling pathways which lead to dedifferentiation and a fibrosis stimulus. This whole process can undergo healing but that depends upon whether the podocytes can be regenerated in full functioning form. Now, the permeability factor related FSGS is thought to be due to a circulating factor that inflicts injury on the podocyte, but we don't know the molecular nature of this permeability factor. In fact, there may be several, such as cardiotropin-like Chemokine 1, SUPAR, IL-13, NICD-40. And the field, I think, is still relatively immature in this arena because we don't have the actual molecular nature of these uh, posited, uh, proposed permeability factor. And we don't know the cellular source, although it has been long thought that they arrive from T cells or B cells or both. Now, the genetically determined forms of FSGS are either monogenic or complex digenic disorders. They're more common in children than they are in adults. There are several pathways of uh, inheritance, but some cases are sporadic and probably present de novo mutations. And a lot of D genes have been identified. Fortunately, 90% of the genes that are causal of FSGS can be identified by mutations at six loci. There are other uh, genetic variants that contribute to FSGS, for, such as APOL1 in African Americans, but the collagen uh, molecules determined by genes at the COL4, A3, 4, and 5 are also a common cause of FSGS, particularly in adults. And there are other syndromic diseases, such as Fabrase or lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase, that can cause an FSGS lesion. Now, screening for a genetic mutation 
is useful in children with an FSGS lesion, but screening of adults prior to treatment probably is not useful, but may be helpful uh, in patients who are steroid resistant, particularly if they have a syndromic presentation and a clear family history of disease. Of course, the younger you are, the more likely it is that you will have a monogenic mutation, particularly in one or more of the podocyte genes. 70% of infants with FSGS, particularly those with congenital nephrotic syndrome, can be identified as having a monogenic, uh, monogenic mutation. And this falls to adults. This slide from uh, the New England Journal of Medicine paper last year emphasizes in the yellow bars how important the collagen 4, A3, A4, and A5 genes are in patients with glomerular disease. In fact, in adults, genetic mutations at these genetic sites represent the majority of genetic forms of FSGS. So if you use a panel containing a large number of exons, 50 or more, you can identify a presumed pathogenetic mutation, either of a podocyte or a base with membrane related gene, in about one of five or one of six adults who have sporadic steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. Now, you might have higher values if the patient presents in a syndromic form, let me emphasize again how important the call for collagen for alpha three, four, five mutations are in adults. The secondary forms of FSGS, of which there are 35 or more now described, uh, follow a number of uh, uh, episodes or instances, such as infections, cancer, drugs, uh, nephron deficiency, maladaptive changes, inflammatory diseases of the glomerulus. And these, of course, require special attention because if you can correct the underlying cause, such as moving a drug or treating an underlying disease, you can modify the outcome. FSGS. So, FSGS, when it presents in a non-primary form, is due to about 85 different causes, which can be divided according to the major categories shown in this slide. This requires, in some cases, a fairly intensive investigation in order to exclude them, because primary FSGS is often a disease of exclusion. Now, fortunately, there are clinical differences between the genetic, secondary, and primary forms of FSGS. Non-primary, non-permeability factor-related FSGS is characterized by a tendency for slow progression, non-nephrotic proteinuria, and normal serum albumin and by an extraordinary resistance to steroid treatment and a very risk of recurrence in renal allografts. So, uh, the histological spectrum of primary, hereditary, and secondary FSGS is significant. comes in about five flavors by light microscopy but defining the subvariants of the histological pattern of the lesion has only limited utility in determining the underlying cause, and renal pathologists actually disagree on its usefulness. Some feel that it is of no value at all, and others feel that it has some utility in defining cause. About 70% of the patients with lesions of FSGS have the, seven, have the classic form I illustrated earlier, and these are most often primary or genetic. In order. 
The perihyalar form is often maladaptive and secondary. The cellular form is often secondary to viral infection or drugs. And the tip lesion uh, is often a primary form of FSGS, and it's also considered a variant of minimal change disease. The collapsing form uh, is seen more often in African Americans with the FOL1 risk alleles, with HIV, with drugs, with systemic syndromes, and in, rarely in patients uh, with lupus photocytopathy. Here are the lesions. You've already seen the not otherwise specified light microscopic pattern. This is the tip variant in which the sclerotic segment protrudes into the early proximal tubule. And here is the collapsing variant with tremendously disordered and deeper differentiating uh, podocytes and collapse of the glomerular architecture. However, the important lessons up to now are that the primary permeability factor related form of FSGS is always the diagnosis of exclusion. Histology alone is insufficient, and the pathogenesis can often not be accurately defined by light microscopy. Many of the cases of primary FSGS are due to a circulating non-immunoglobulin permeability factor, uh, which uh, expresses itself in the recurrence of the disease in about 50 to 70 percent of renal allograft, and it disappears when a kidney FSGS is transmitted into a non-FSGS patient. Even in 2020, unfortunately, there is no single clinical or laboratory biomarker that can unequivocally and positively identify primary permeability factor in FSGS, and this is a major gap in our knowledge. Now, the primary permeability factor related FSGS most commonly presents with a full blown nephrotic syndrome, low serum albumin, and marked proteinuria. Typically non selective, but albumin represents more than 50% of the total protein in nearly all cases. The immunofluorescent findings are quite variable, but I can see, can be seen in the sclerotic lesions, and this may have prognostic significance. The important finding is that in electron microscopy, Foot processes are extensively effaced, similar to minimal change disease, all of the glomeruli in the sample, not just the one showing the focal lesion. However, this must be ascertained in an intact, non-sclerotic glomerulus during active nephrotic syndrome, not previously treated. As shown by Praga in a nice paper uh, uh, in the end of the 20th century, Hypoalbuminemia plus an FSGS lesion and proteinuria greater than 35, 3.5 grams per, per day was sensitive and specific in identifying a primary form of FSGS, even after a full evaluation. But normal albuminemia with an FSGS lesion and nephrotic range proteinuria was mostly associated with FSGS, and only about 10% of the patients turned out to have primary FSGS. It is our view that electron microscopy is an essential uh, procedure for enhancing the accuracy of differentiation of the primary from secondary FGS accepting the collapsing variant. But unfortunately, EM studies do not reliably distinguish a genetic form from a primary form. The finding that uh, helps to identify the FSGS lesion as either genetic or a primary permeability factor process is diffuse foot process effacement. Segmental foot process effacement in a non-sclerotic glomerulus by EM 
usually indicates secondary FSGS or an unknown form of FSGS. Here are two patients showing very different lesions. On the top, here is a light microscopic lesion of focal and segmental glomerular sclerosis associated with diffuse foot process of facelift. Here is a similar focal and segmental glomerulosclerotic lesion with intact, fairly intact foot processes along the outer aspect of the basal membrane. The patient in the top two panels has primary FSGS, in the bottom two panels has secondary FSGS. So one can use electron microscopy and serum albumin and urine protein to make a distinction in patients with FSGS lesions, except those having the collapsing form, into primary or secondary forms. The presence of nephrotic syndrome and widespread foot process effacement in primary FSGS and absence of the full nephrotic syndrome and segmental lesions indicates secondary FSGS. <laughs> now, in patients who have nephrotic syndrome, but no, uh, uh, they have nephrotic syndrome, and diffuse foot process of face would generally go on to first-line therapy, such as steroid. And in those patients who are resistant, genetic testing is advocated because one wants to determine whether the patient has a genetic disease before pursuing secondary lines of treatment. Genetic testing is also indicated in patients who have diffuse foot process effacement, but who do not have nephrotic syndrome, and of course in patients who have secondary forms of FSGS by segmental foot process effacement, but have no evidence of a known cause. So genetic testing is beginning to play an important role in the evaluation of the lesion of FSGS. Now the prognosis of uh, the FSGS lesion and the diseases that it produces uh, are generally unfavored because spontaneous complete remissions are quite uncommon. However, the magnitude of the proteinuria over time can fluctuate spontaneously, and the magnitude and persistence of proteinuria are the main drivers of progression in all forms of FSGS. Proteinuria alone is not the only driver of progression. The extent of the lesions in the kidney, the baseline glomerular filtration rate, the uh, Excuse me. Uh, the presence of hypertension, high lipid levels, high blood uric acid, birth weight, some believe fractional IgG excretion, uh, and the reduction in the amount of podocytes in any given biopsy. All of these factors can contribute to the progression of FSGS. But obviously the most important one is the magnitude of proteinuria. And the long-term survival in patients with the FSGS lesion is very favorable if they're not nephrotic, not so good if they're nephrotic, and very poor if massive proteinuria persists. The degree of proteinuria is very much related to the, de the decline of GFR over time. Here shown in the red bars are the change in GFR in milliliters per minute per year in patients with the FSGS lesion over a broad range of proteinuria. You can see that the degree of proteinuria above about 2 grams per day is associated with a progressive increase in the risk of a progressive GFR decline. This is different from that seen in IgA nephropathy and in membranous nephropathy shown in light blue and dark blue. So the degree of proteinuria and its prognostic implications depend upon 
the underlying uh, disease processes. Now, I'd like to finish with a few comments on uh, the treatment of FSGS in 2020. The standard of care in 2020, the basic principles, are that proven secondary and genetic FSGS should be treated by correction of the underlying cause, which is seldom possible in genetic FSGS, and by nonspecific antiproteinuric agents, largely RAS inhibition, not with steroids alone. Now, intensive CNI, cyclosporin or tacrolimus, may be effective in some genetic forms of FSGS, but in my opinion, this has not been rigorously tested in randomized control trials. Presumed primary FSGS with non-nephrotic proteinuria should be treated conservatively, mainly with blood pressure control and RAS inhibition, not with immunosuppressive therapy. In patients who have primary non-genetic FSGS with nephrotic syndrome, prolonged oral glucocorticoid therapy as of 2020 remains the initial treatment of choice unless it's contraindicated by uh, a high risk of adverse events such as in diabetes or obesity or in patients who have very extensive interstitial fibrosis and advanced stages of CKD. In order to achieve a remission with uh, steroids in FSGS, a prolonged course of treatment is required. Eight weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks is generally not sufficient. Longer periods of treatment improve the response rate. However, as you know, High-dose steroids is associated with a lot of side effects, and a great number of patients cannot tolerate this kind of high-dose, prolonged steroid administration. Nonspecific therapy of an FSGS lesion with RAS inhibition tends to be much less effective in primary than in secondary FSGS. In fact, proof of efficacy for RAS inhibition in primary permeability promoting FSGS is largely lacking, unfortunately. Now, if you happen to have FSGS of the permeability promoting uh, variety, primary FSGS, steroid therapy results in a remission, either complete or partial, in 60% or more of the patients treated. Obviously, if you don't know that the patient has primary FSGS and you attempt to treat an FSGS lesion due to a genetic mutation, the response to therapy will be much less. In those patients who achieve a partial or a complete response of proteinuria, the 10-year renal survival is 92% versus only 33% for non-responders. There does not appear to be any major difference in response between patients with tip lesion, not otherwise specified, or collapsing lesion, but this is a controversial point. Some studies have suggested better responses in tip lesion and worse responses in collapsing lesion. Now, the specific treatment options for primary FSGS in 2020 are very few. Glucocorticoids and calcineurin inhibitors are useful. Glucocorticoids can achieve about a 60% response rate in primary FSGS, and calcineurin inhibitors may provide additional benefits in either steroid-resistant or responsive and relapsing disease. And this has been shown by several randomized controlled trials. However, after glutocorticoids and calcineurin inhibitors, the efficacy of drugs and the proof underlying them drops off substantially. Mycophenolic acid salts are not 
of certain efficacy, and there's only one RCT. Cyclophosphamide, not useful at all in steroid-resistant disease. Acthar gel showed a 30% response rate only in one observational trial. It's never been confirmed, and there are no randomized control trials. Rituximab can be helpful in steroid responses and relapsing FSGS and perhaps in recurrent FSGS in the renal transplant, but there are no randomized controlled trials. Plasma exchange and immunoabsorption, lipoprotein apheresis, with or without immunosuppression, has shown some benefit in steroid-resistant disease, but no RCTs. Combination, no RCTs. Sirolimus, probably harmful, no RCTs, and galactose, only a very uncertain efficacy, but it happens to be very safe. So there's considerable uncertainty regarding the treatment of primary permeability factor FSGS with commercially available agents, all off-label, beyond the use of steroids and CNI. This has led to a host of new investigational drugs, and the list is growing uh, each month by new trials. There are one, two, three, four, five major trials underway currently looking at new drugs, specific targeted agents in the treatment of FSGS. Many of these have reached phase three, and we may know in another year or so, whether we can add something beyond steroids and cyclosporin. I know there is considerable interest in mesenchymal stem cell therapy of uh, FSGS. Uh, there are promising studies in animal models and a few clinical examples, but a randomized control trial is needed to bring this approach to treatment up to the clinical level. So the standard of care in 2020 for primary FSGS is steroids first, possibly uh, calcineurin inhibitors in replacement for uh, steroids in those who have some uh, side effect of diabetes or obesity, uh, in which CNIs might be considered for initial therapy. Here is a non-randomized control retrospective study showing that the outcomes for patients treated initially with a calcineurin inhibitor versus those treated with high-dose steroids is not very different, although it may even be superior to steroids uh, over long-term observation. Obviously, we need a direct head-to-head -head control trial to confirm this suggestion. In a few months, you will know what the KDGO practice guidelines are. You know, they have been signed off officially, and I understand that they are going to press soon, and they'll probably be released sometime in November, where everything that I've discussed to this point will be translated into a therapeutic recommendation. So the take-home message in the context of the lesion of FSGS that I want to emphasize is that it is a pattern of injury, not a specific disease, due to very diverse pathogenetic mechanism, electron very useful, if not essential, for proper diagnosis. And before you undertake a therapeutic intervention, an evaluation of possible causes in the main categories, primary, genetic, secondary, and unknown, must be undertaken. And in the final analysis, remissions of proteuria may be more important than light microscopic histology for long-term outcomes. But at the present state of our knowledge in 2020, prolonged steroid treatment can obtain a remission of nephrotic syndrome and avoid end-stage renal failure, but at the expense of steroid-related complications, and similar steroid therapy is ineffective.
in secondary and genetic FSGS. Thank you very much for your attention, Thank and you I've really enjoyed Lesson. this visit. With you. Thank you very much for this very nice presentation, very clear, practical, applied, and we learned a lot from FSGS, and I agree with you, FSGS is a real conundrum, uh, a lot of uncertainty and myth. Sometimes we found cases very straight, responding well to steroids, and other cases resistant to all modalities. And uh, as I am working in a transplant center, sometimes we face many problems after transplantations with patients with primary FSGS. And uh, the, one of our clinic around with my prof, Muhammad Sobh, uh, uh, we imagine that if we tested the permeability factor in our animal lab to test the uh, permeability, uh, the, if we inject the serum of the patient in rat and find proteinuria, the, uh, what, what is your opinion about this approach to test for permeability factor? Yeah. Well, as you know, bioassays for the permeability factor are available on a research basis only. There is no uh, approved form of biologic testing for permeability factor that is generally available. And when you test for these permeability factors, they're not just one factor, but many, uh, there will be patients who have no permeability factor that will recur in the graft, and there are patients who have high levels of permeability factor that for some reason do not recur. So the concordance between the level or the presence of these permeability factors are not highly predictive of outcome. Perhaps this is the um, manifestation of the efficacy of the prophylactic therapy used to prevent rejection of allograft, cyclosporin, or tacrolimus, MMF, and steroids. Uh, I wish I could say that we had uh, made a lot of progress in the better prediction of a uh, risk of FSG, uh, recurrent FSGS. What we do know is that if you had an FSGS lesion, and low serum albumin and nephrotic syndrome, prior to the development of end-stage renal disease, your chances of developing a recurrence of FSGS are about 70%, seven out of 10 cases. These patients should have protocol biopsies done early in the course, and if a lesion of diffuse foot process effacement is seen, by electron microscopy, they should be immediately treated with plasma exchange, which has been shown to be beneficial in the treatment of recurrent FSGS. Whether rituximab and FSGS are added to plasma exchange is more beneficial, is not known, but many groups in the United States and around the world do add rituximab uh, to a plasma exchange for the treatment of severe uh, recurrent FSGS. The problem is that some of the patients, although they will respond to plasma exchange, become plasma exchange dependent. And every time you try to stop the plasma exchange, they will relapse. And of course, those patients need to re uh, have repeated plasma exchange treatments for uh, sometimes months or even years. I have a patient that required two years of weekly plasma exchange. Finally, it was possible to stop the plasma exchange without a relapse. So uh, you mean protocol biopsy in the presence of protonuria or protocol biopsy in non-protonuric post-transplant patients? No. I think they deserve to have a a protocol biopsy, uh, irrespective of what the urine protein looks like. As you know, in the first two weeks after transplantation, often uh, some degree of proteinuria, whether it's coming from the remaining two kidneys uh, or not, is not known. Uh, I want to know if a patient, two weeks after transplantation, 
still has perfectly normal glomeruli by light by if diffuse foot process of facement is present, I would be inclined to treat them. Now, as Mayo Clinic, because they are so concerned about early treatment of relapse, they ligate both of the ureters of the patient's native kidneys to avoid the possible confusion in the early post-transplant coming from the diseased and, and very minimally functioning kidneys. That's not widely done around the United States. It was a discussion on the ASN community site, but I think it's a safe procedure and it is still in patients at the Mayo Clinic who have FSGS and who are at high risk, 70% or more of uh, Thank you very much. Uh, the last point, my last point, is genetic testing. You want to do genetic testing before? Do we lost? The indications of genetic testing should it be done a routine for all cases, or to strict genetic testing for syndromic or for nephrotic before one, the age, so, first age and. Yeah. Uh, let me try to let me try to make it clear. In an adult, genetic testing by whole econ, uh, exon sequencing using a panel of genes, both call for a uh, call for genes and side genes, is indicated in a steroid resistant patient, or in a patient with a family history of nephrotic syndrome, or in a patient with a syndromic presentation, such as uh, scrotal hemangiomas in uh, Fabre's disease, such as deafness in Alport's, such as uh, foot drop in peripheral nephropathies, uh, 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 and uh, nail patella syndrome. Those kind of presentations require genetic testing uh, well in advance of treatment. Professor Sarhanaga? Yes, Dr. Richard, thank you for your uh, nice presentation. Uh, I am interested in uh, FSGS, and I read uh, now about the new classifications which remove Apple 1, consider this Apple 1 associated nephropathy, and also, and also uh, HIV or cord collapsing associated nephropathy. Not focus uh, segmented. They remove them from the classification. And yeah. also the change in the histopathology in the past, we consider idiopathic focal segmental as only podocytopathy. But we now know from the histology different changes in the mesangium or interstitial or in the vessel. Yeah. Well, I'll try to answer the question about collapsed nephropathy. I tend to avoid the term collapsing FSGS because I think collapsing nephropathy is a totally separate disease entity. It requires a totally different approach. Collapsing nephropathy uh, usually a fundamental susceptibility to podocyte injury such as seen in the patients with ApoL1, high-risk alleles, uh, and in other patients. So the finding of collapsing nephropathy usually indicates that it is superimposed on a fundamental predisposition to podocyte injury. Viral diseases, particularly HIV, COVID-19, parvovirus, cytomegalovirus, possibly Epstein-Barr, all of those viruses in a susceptible patient may evoke a lesion. Yes. Now, if you take a kidney from a donor who has one of these predisposing genes and you put it into a, a recipient with end-stage renal disease, they very often will develop collapsing glomerulopathy because the transplant procedure itself 
can be a, an insult that brings out uh, the and allows a collapsing nephropathy to be expressed. Now, obviously, if you have a biopsy that shows collapsing FSGS, you must rule out IV, which is fairly simple with uh, appropriate serologic tests. You need to examine the possibility of other viral infections. In your area of the world, hepatitis C would be certainly one potential candidate. Uh, and you need to look other precipitating factors, such as drugs, uh, like androgen use uh, or interferon treatment uh, or uh, monsteroidals. There's a whole host of drugs that can uh, precipitate this. Anything that increases interferon elaboration in a susceptible patient is likely to produce a collapsing lesion. Thanks for that excellent question. Very but important. They consider it as a separate entity, not FSGS. I what personally think that it is better and more appropriate for individual evaluation. Collapsing lesions are separated as a distinct entity, as collapsing nephropathy rather than collapsing FSGS. Most of my talk has not uh, been uh, related to collapsing nephropathy. It's related to not other specified FSGS lesion in a patient with or without the nephrotic syndrome. How about Apoll 1 also? They remove it from Apoll 1, Apoll 1 nephropathy, yeah. associated nephropathy, and not FSGS. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in African Americans who have the uh, high risk alleles, uh, they uh, can develop hypertension and global glomerulosclerosis, not FSGS. The exact reasons underlying the association between hypertension, osis, not focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, in some African Americans is not well understood. But APOL1 nephropathy is manifested by hypertension, variable degrees of proteinuria, and of course the two risk alleles, uh, the genomic analysis. Yeah, uh, Professor uh, Richard, if you allow me, uh, you know, now currently the main issue or the dilemma in uh, uh, diagnostic approach for patient with uh, FSGS. Uh, sometimes we don't find sclerotic lesion initially, and we are not sure is it because the technique currently used for light microscopic examination is not um, efficient, or it is a late finding. Uh, so what do you think about new technique uh, like 3D morphometric analysis for the biopsy to check uh, early the sclerotic lesion? Do we have to spend more time uh, in our improving technique to find the sclerotic lesion, or to spend time to find a marker like in membranous anti-PLA2R or ANCA in vasculitis. Uh, the second point, uh, in patient with recurrent uh, FSGS post-transplant, if we can extrapolate for native kidney uh, focal segmental, the good response to rituximab, does it mean the B lymphocyte might be implicated in the pathogenesis of focal segmental? And if so, why some patients, they don't respond post-transplant? There are some rituximab responder and the other yeah. rituximab non-responder. Those are all very good questions. I'll try to answer them as best I can. I'm limited because of the data is not sufficient to give a clear answer. Well, let's take the issue of identification of the FSGS lesion in renal biopsy first. You're quite correct that sampling error is a big problem in any focal disease. And if you have a biopsy uh, in a nephrotic patient with a low serum albumin that has 10 glomeruli, and they're all apparently normal, and electron microscopy shows only foot process effacement, you cannot rule out FSGS as a lesion. You could call it minimal change disease because that's what you see, but the likelihood that you're missing 
a lesion of FSGS is pretty high. Now, I wish there were biomarkers in the tissue that we could use to identify those kind of patients. Theoretically, the lesion in the podocytes in minimal change disease and FSGS should be similar. So it's not likely that looking at the podocyte biology will be the answer. However, we now have several markers of alterations in podocyte biology that may allow better differentiation. RAC1, which is a protein involved in the dedifferentiation of podocytes, to be a very good of the uh, upregulation of TRPC5, which is a channel in the podocytes that are associated with the lesion of FSGS. So it's possible going forward, we may have biomarkers, maybe super uh, and its sub uh, variants or its uh, subtypes, or RAC1. Uh, or podocalyxin. These are all worthy of investigation, but I can't tell you that we have a precise of making a distinction between FSGS and minimal change disease when the biopsy sample is small. And unfortunately, that's not a, an uncommon event. Now, it may be that going forward, that morphometry of the a careful examination of the biopsy will help give clues to make a differentiation. Your question about B and T cells and recurrence of FSGS in the transplant are very good. Very good. After all, the uh, treatment that we use to prevent rejection is primarily effective against T cells, not so effective against B cells. Uh, so a recurrence in the graph of FSGS may be a manifestation of un unrepressed B cell mechanism. If so, why isn't rituximab more effective than recurrences? We don't know. It may be that the uh, pathogenesis of recurrent FSGS is diverse. And it depends on the specific permeability factor and its source. Some may be B cell dependent, uh, as in minimal change disease, whereas others are not so B cell dependent. This will require a lot more work. We don't have good answers to that question. But thank you. It's a key question going forward. I would like to end this uh, presentation by thanking and appreciating your presence with us. It is really a marvelous presentation. And, you, uh, and as I mentioned in the beginning, you are the father of nephrology because I know you visited more than 90, 90 countries giving a presentation. So I don't know if there is anyone on, on this earth have this presentation in 90 countries. So you are uh, really uh, the great professor and it's an honor to have you. And you are waiting the 21st of November to learn a lot from your experience. Thank you very much for your time okay. and goodbye. Have a good evening. Thank you very much.